The urinary system. The urinary system is the major excretory system of our body. Some organs in other systems also eliminate wastes, but they are not able to compensate in case of kidney failure. Urinary system, also known as the renal system, consists of the following parts. We have the kidneys, ureters, bladder, and urethra. The purpose of the urinary system is to eliminate the excess water from the body, regulate blood volume and blood pressure, control and regulate the level of electrolytes and blood pH. Let's start with the kidneys. The two kidneys are located in the upper abdominal cavity on either side of the vertebral column, behind the peritoneum. The upper portions of the kidneys rest on the lower surface of the diaphragm and are enclosed and protected by the lower rib cage. The kidneys are embedded in adipose tissue that acts as a cushion and is in turn covered by fibrous connective tissue, uh, fibrous connective tissue membrane called the renal fascia, which helps hold the kidneys in place. Each kidney has an indentation called the helus on its medial side. At the helus, the renal artery enters the kidney and the renal vein and ureter emerge. The renal artery is a branch of the abdominal aorta and the renal vein returns blood to the inferior vena cava. The ureter carries urine from the kidney to the urinary bladder. The kidney and urinary system help the body eliminate liquid waste called urea and to keep chemicals such as potassium and sodium and water in balance. Urea is produced when food containing proteins such as meat, poultry, and certain vegetables are broken down in the body. Urea is carried in the bloodstream to the kidneys where it is removed along with water and other wastes in the form of urine. What are the internal structures of the kidney? In a coronal or frontal section of the kidney, um, three areas can be distinguished. The lateral and the middle areas are tissue layers and the middle area at the helos is a cavity. The outer tissue layer is called renal cortex. It is made of renal corpuscles and convoluted tubules. These are parts of the nephron and are described in the next section or in our next slides. The inner tissue layer is the renal medulla, which is made of loops of Hindley and collecting tubules. The renal medulla consists of wedge-shaped pieces called renal pyramids. The tip of each pyramid is its apex or papilla. The third area, the renal pelvis, this is not a layer of tissues but rather a cavity formed by the expansion of the ureter within the kidney at the halos. Funnel-shaped extension of the renal pelvis called calyces includes the papillae of the renal pyramids and then urine flows from the renal pyramids into the calyces, then to the renal pelvis and out into the ureter. So your calyces are here. These are your papilla of the pyramid. This is your um, whole kidney and its basic unit which is your nephron. The nephron. A nephron is the basic structural and functional unit of your kidney. They are the microscopic structure composed of a renal corpuscle and a renal tubule. The, world, uh, the word nephron is derived from the Greek word nephros, meaning kidney. There are about millions of nephrons in each human kidney. Types of nephron. We have cortical nephron and juxtamedullary nephron. The primary function of nephron is removing all waste products, including the solid wastes and other excess water from the blood, converting blood into the urine, reabsorption, secretion, and excretion of numerous substances. Glomerulus, where is that? Here. So this is your whole nephron, and your glomerulus is this one. The glomerulus is a network of small blood vessels, known as tuft located at the beginning of a nephron in the kidney. The glomerulus blood supply from an afferent arteriole in the renal arterial circulation. In the kidney, the glomerulus represents the initial location of renal filtration of blood. 
enters the glomerulus through the afferent arteriole at the vascular pole. It undergoes filtration in the glomerular capillaries and exits the glomerulus through the efferent arteriole at the vascular pole. Glomerulus filters water and small solutes out of the bloodstream. The resulting filtrate contains other substances the body needs, essential ions, glucose, amino acids, and smaller proteins. When the filtrate exits the glomerulus, it flows into a duct in the nephron called the renal tubule. So here, this is your glomerulus. And it's, it's a part of your nephron. Kidneys are bean-shaped organs which filters blood. It removes waste substances from the blood and regulates water and electrolyte concentrations within the body fluids. The end product of this function is urine, which is excreted outside of the body through urethra, containing wastes, excess water and excess electrolytes. Urine formation involves glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, and tubular secretion. The nephron is kidney's functional unit. At the beginning of the nephron, the glomerulus is a network, tuft of capillaries, that performs the first step of filtering the blood. The glomerulus is encased in thin, double-walled capsules called Bowman's capsule. The space inside the capsule and surrounding the glomerulus is called Bowman's space. As the blood travels through these capillaries of glomerulus, filtration causes a lot of plasma contents to spill out into Bowman's space through the glomerular filtration membrane. It consists of three layers of capillary valve, endothelium, basement membrane, and epithelial podocytes. This membrane allows some particles of blood to pass through, but not all. The fluid that is filtrate from the capillary blood into Bowman space is called filtrate and forms the primary urine. A renal corpuscle consists of a glomerulus surrounded by a Bowman's capsule. The glomerulus is a capillary network that arises from an afferent arteriole and empties into an efferent arteriole. The diameter of the efferent arteriole is smaller than that of the afferent arteriole, which helps maintain a fairly high blood pressure in the glomerulus. Your renal corpuscle is composed of your Bowman's capsule and your glomerulus. So here's your glomerulus and here is your Bowman's capsule. Bowman's capsule is the expanded end of a renal tubule. It encloses the glomerulus. The inner layer of Bowman's capsule is made of podocytes. The name means foot cells and the feet of the podocytes are on the surface of the glomerular capillaries. The arrangement of podocytes creates pores, spaces between adjacent feet, which make this layer very permeable. The outer layer of Bowman's capsule has no pores and is not permeable. The space between the inner and outer layers of the Bowman's capsule contain renal filtrate, the fluid that is formed from the blood in the glomerulus and will eventually become urine. The renal tubule continues from Bowman's capsule and consists of the following parts. The proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, and the distal convoluted tubule. The blood brought by the renal artery is filtered by the glomerulus and then passed to the PCT or the, the proximal convoluted tubule. Maximum reabsorption takes place in the PCT of the nephron. PCT is the region of renal tubule where reabsorption of es essential substances like glucose, protein, amino acids, and major portion of electrolytes and water takes place. The surface area for reabsorption is facilitated by the lining of the simple cuboidal epithelium in them. Reabsorption takes place at the expense of energy. 
PCT selectively secretes ions such as hydrogen, ammonia, and potassium into the, uh, into the filtrate and absorbs bicarbonate from it. Thus, PCT maintains the electrolyte and acid-base balance of the body fluids. Henle's loop or the loop of Henle. It has a descending and ascending limb. Being parts of the same loop, both the descending and ascending limbs shows different permeability. The descending limb is permeable to water but impermeable to an electrolyte, while the ascending limb is permeable to electrolytes but impermeable to water. What does permeable mean? Water, for example, passes through a permeable uh, layer or membrane. You can penetrate or the water can penetrate and go through. Pwede makaagi, dida. Okay? Since the electrolytes get reabsorbed at the ascending loop of Henle, the filtrate gets diluted as it moves towards the ascending limb, but reabsorption is limited in this segment. Distal convoluted tubule, or the DCT. The DCT, which is the last part of the nephron, connects and empties its contents into collecting ducts that line the medullary pyramids. The collecting ducts amass contents from multiple nephrons and fuse together as they enter the papillae of the renal medulla. Similar to PCT, DCT also secretes ions such as hydrogen, potassium, and ammonia into the filtrate while reabsorbing the bicarbonate from the filtrate. Conditional reabsorption of sodium ions and water takes place in DCT. Thus, it maintains the pH and sodium potassium level in the blood cells. Collecting duct is a long straight tube where the hydrogen and potassium ions are secreted to maintain the electrolyte balance of the blood. This is also the region where the maximum reabsorption of water takes place to produce concentrated urine. The filtration membrane. The filtration membrane consists of the endothelium, the podocytes, and the basement membrane. The first step of urine formation, fluid consisting of water and solutes smaller than proteins passes from the blood in the glomerular capillaries through the filtration membrane into the Bowman's capsule. The fluid that is forced across the filtration membrane is called filtrate. A system of blood vessels allow the exchange of materials that occurs in the kidney. The renal arteries branch off abdominal aorta and enter the kidneys. They give rise to several branches and these are the following, the interlobar, arcuate, interlobular, afferent arterioles, and peritubular capillaries. So earlier, na mentioned na an afferent and efferent. So afferent arteriole is a branch of the renal artery that brings blood to the glomerulus. Efferent is a branch of the renal artery that drains blood away from the glomerulus. So here are the veins and the arteries which supplies blood to your kidneys. So they are um, encircled. The excretory system in human beings consists of a pair of kidneys. A magnified view of the longitudinal section of kidney shows two prominent regions, a cortex and a medulla. As we zoom into the cortex region, it shows the presence of numerous nephrons. Each nephron has a Bowman's capsule, a proximal convoluted tubule, a loop of Henle, a distal convoluted tubule that leads to a collecting duct. Nephrons are convoluted in the cortex region and straighten out as loops in the medulla region. Each nephron has a Bowman's capsule, which is a cup-shaped structure that has a layer made of squamous epithelial cells. In the cavity of the Bowman's capsule, there is a bundle of capillaries known as the glomerulus. The blood vessel entering the Bowman's capsule is known as the efferent arteriole and is thicker than the blood vessel exiting the capsule, which is thinner and is known as the efferent arteriole. 
the Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus together form the Malphigian body. This capsule extends into the proximal convoluted tubule PCT on the inner side. This tubule is lined by a brush bordered epithelium with numerous microvilli. This PCT leads into the loop of Henle which lies in the medulla region. It is U-shaped and has a descending limb and an ascending limb. This further leads into the distal convoluted tubule which is again seen in the cortex region and it finally joins the collecting duct. As blood flows through the glomerulus, water, salts and waste diffuse into the Bowman's capsule. This liquid then passes into the PCT and the loop of Henle where water and important salts are absorbed back into the blood vessel. Only the waste material like urea and some water molecules proceed into the DCT where more water may get absorbed into the interstitial fluid. This liquid formed is the urine which is released into the collecting duct. This finally trickles through the kidney into the ureter which helps the passage of urine into the urinary bladder. After a while, the urine can be excreted from the bladder. To summarize, the excretory system in human beings consists of a pair of kidneys. The longitudinal section of kidney shows two prominent regions, a cortex and a medulla. Inside the kidney, we observed numerous nephrons. Each nephron has a Bowman's capsule, a proximal convoluted tubule, a loop of Henle, a distal convoluted tubule that leads to a collecting duct. In the cavity of the Bowman's capsule, there is a bundle of capillaries known as the glomerulus. As blood flows through the glomerulus, water, salts and waste diffuse into the Bowman's capsule. This liquid then passes into the PCT and the loop of Henle where water and important salts are absorbed back into the blood vessel. Only the waste material like urea and some water molecules proceed into the DCT where more water may get absorbed into the interstitial fluid. The liquid remaining in the DCT is the urine which is finally released into the collecting duct. Ureters The bilateral ureters connect the pelvis of each kidney to the bladder. The ureters consist of smooth involuntary muscle which serves as the conduit of urine from the kidneys into the bladder. The bladder is the muscular organ that serves as the collection and retention vessel which temporarily holds and retains urine prior to urination. A normal urinary bladder can hold up to 800 ml of urine. Urethra Urethra transports urine from the bladder to the outside of the body. The male gender has two urethral sphincters to control both the passage of urine and sperm and the female has only one urethral sphincter to control the flow of urine. These are the three major processes in urine formation. We have filtration, tubular reabsorption, and tubular secretion. Urine formation Urine is formed in the Bowman's capsule. Urine formation involves three main processes 1 glomerular filtration 2 reabsorption 3 secretion that takes place in different parts of the nephron filtration is carried by glomerules and is called glomerular filtration the glomerular capillary blood pressure causes filtration of blood through three layers 1 
endothelium of glomerular blood vessels, 2. Epithelium of Bowman's capsule, and 3. Basement membrane between these two layers. The epithelial cells of Bowman's capsule called podocytes, one arranged in an intricate manner so as to leave some minute spaces called slip pores. When the blood flows through the capillaries in the glomerules, it gets filtered through the pores in the walls of capillaries. All the water soluble, small molecular weight substances such as salts, glucose, amino acids along with nitrogenous wastes are filtered from blood. Blood cells and proteins are not filtered through the pores present in the capillary walls. This filtration is called ultrafiltration. On an average, 1100 to 1200 ml of blood is filtered by the kidneys per minute. Approximately 120 milliliters of urine is formed in the kidney per minute. In 24 hours, about 175 liters of urine is formed. However, all this is not excreted. Only one or two liters of urine is excreted and the rest of it is reabsorbed into the body. The amount of filtrate formed by the kidneys per minute is called glomerular filtration rate GFR. GFR is a healthy individual is approximately 125 milliliters per minute that is 180 milliliters per day. The kidneys have built-in mechanism for regulation of glomerular filtration rate. One such efficient mechanism is carried out by Chexta Glomerular Apparatus, JGA. It is a special sensitive region formed by cellular modifications in the distal convoluted tubule and the efferent arteriole at the location of their contact. A fall in GFR can activate the JG cells to release renin which can stimulate the glomerular blood flow and thereby the GFR back to normal. Secretion During urine formation, the tubular cells secrete substances like H+, K+, and ammonia into the filtrate. Tubular secretion is also an important step in urine formation as it helps in the maintenance of ionic and acid-base balance of body fluids. The comparison of the volume of the filtrate formed per day, 180 liters per day, to that of urine released, 1.5 liters, suggests that 99% of filtrate has to be reabsorbed by the renal tubules. This process is called reabsorption. The reabsorption of the urine produced by Bowman's capsule takes place in the tubular portion. When the filtrate reaches the proximal convoluted tubule, the epithelial cells of the tubule reabsorb several substances in a selective manner and transport them back to blood. They perform this either by passive or active mechanism. Example glucose, amino acids, aniplas, etc. in the filtrate are reabsorbed actively whereas nitrogenous waste are absorbed by passive transport. Reabsorption of water also occurs passively in the initial segments of the nephron in loop of Henle and in distal convoluted tubule. Unabsorbed substances along with water enter the collecting duct which discharges urine into pelvis and then into ureter. Urine is produced continuously and is concentrated continuously. This reaches pelvis and is excreted. Smooth muscles, involuntary muscles in the wall of ureter produce peristaltic movements 
which propel urine into the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder is a muscular sac and opens to the outside through urethra. At the junction of bladder and urethra is a sphincter. Urination is a reflex action, but in elders it is voluntary. In children, urination is an involuntary action. Normally, when about 200 to 300 milliliters of urine reaches the bladder, the muscles in its wall contract and relax, expelling urine. Functions of the tubules 1. Proximal convoluted tubule 1. Is lined by simple cuboidal brush border epithelium which increases the surface area for reabsorption. 70 to 80% of electrolytes and water are reabsorbed by this segment. 2. It helps to maintain the pH and ionic balance of body fluids by selective secretion of H plus, NH3 and K plus ions into the filtrate and by absorption of HCO3 minus from it. 2. Henley's loop maintains high osmolarity of medullary and interstitial fluid. The descending limb is permeable to water but impermeable to electrolytes. This concentrates the filtrate as it moves down. The ascending limb is impermeable to water but allows transport of electrolytes actively or passively. Therefore, as the concentrated filtrate pass upward, it gets diluted due to the passage of electrolytes due to the medullary fluid. Distal convoluted tubule 1. Conditional reabsorption of Na plus and water takes place in this segment. It is also capable of reabsorption of bicarbonate HCl3 minus. 2. Selective secretion of hydrogen H and potassium K plus and ammonia NH3 to maintain pH and sodium Na potassium K balance in blood. Collecting duct. 1. Large amount of water could be reabsorbed to produce concentrated urine. 2. 2. It allows passage of small amounts of urea into medullary interstitium to keep up osmolarity. 3. It plays a role in the maintenance of pH and ionic balance of blood by selective secretion of H plus and K plus ions. Diuretics. These are chemicals that increase the rate of urine formation. Diuretics are used to treat hypertension as well as several types of edema caused by congestive heart failure, cirrhosis of the liver, and other disorders. So these are some of the diuretics we know. The sodium ion reabsorption inhibitors, we have osmotic diuretics and caffeine. Hormonal mechanisms. We have three. First is the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanism, antidiuretic hormone mechanism, and atrial natriuretic hormone mechanism. Renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanism happens when renin, which is released primarily by the kidneys, stimulates the formation of angiotensin in blood and tissues, which in turn stimulates the release of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. Renin is a proteolytic enzyme that is released into the circulation by the kidney, specifically the juxtaglomerular apparatuses. The RAAS is a complex multi-organ mechanism where endocrine system is involved in the regulation of blood pressure by balancing fluid and electrolyte levels as well as regulating vascular resistance and tone. RAAS regulates sodium and water absorption in the kidney 
thus directly having an impact on systemic blood pressure. Low blood pressure stimulates renin secretion from the kidney. Renin stimulates the production of angiotensin 1, which is converted to angiotensin 2. Okay, so if there is decreased BP, there will be increased renin secretion from your kidney. Now, renin stimulates the production of angiotensin 1, which is converted to angiotensin 2, which in turn stimulates the aldosterone secretion here from the adrenal cortex. This then increases the sodium and water reabsorption, which now results in increased blood pressure. RAAS, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. RAAS, renin angiotensin aldosterone system, is a hormone-based system that helps to regulate blood pressure and blood volume. Low blood pressure stimulates release of renin by the kidney and catalyzes the conversion of angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1, which elevates blood pressure. Angiotensin stimulates the secretion of the hormone aldosterone from the adrenal gland, which promotes sodium and water retention in the kidney, thus increasing blood pressure and blood volume. Antidiuretic hormone mechanism. Antidiuretic hormone binds to receptors on cells in the collecting ducts of the kidney and promotes reabsorption of water back into the circulation. These channels transport solute-free water through tubular cells and back into blood, leading to a decrease in plasma osmolarity and an increase in osmolarity of urine. Secretion of antidiuretic hormone also occurs if the concentration of salts in the bloodstream increases, for example, as a result of not drinking enough water on a hot day. This is detected by special nerve cells in the hypothalamus, which stimulate antidiuretic hormone release from the pituitary. Increased blood solute concentration affects hypothalamic neurons and decreased blood pressure affects baroreceptors. As a result of these stimuli, the posterior pituitary secretes ADH, which increase water reabsorption in the kidney. What happens in your body when you start getting dehydrated? Water levels in the blood decrease and this is detected by receptors on cells in the hypothalamus. These receptors are called osmoreceptors. In response, the cells secrete the signaling molecule antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. ADH is a hydrophilic peptide hormone. The ADH is released from the pituitary and travels in the blood to the kidneys, where urine is produced. Nephrons in the kidney filter urea, salts, and other solutes out of the blood. The last part of the nephron, the collecting duct, is the final place the body can reabsorb water. ADH receptors are located on cells lining the collecting duct. ADH binding to its receptor triggers a cascade of interactions between molecules inside the cell. This process is called signal transduction. It activates vesicles containing water channels called aquaporins. These are inserted into the plasma membrane. More water can now move from the collecting duct back into the blood. Because of ADH, less water ends up in the urine and the urine becomes more concentrated. So if you are dehydrated, ADH helps you to conserve water by decreasing your urine production. Adi naman na atrial natriuretic hormone pinapaihi kalugod niya. Okay, so dapat kuno malus ni mo ang sodium. So there should be an increase in so sodium excretion and water loss in the form of urine. Atrial natriuretic hormone mechanism. 
The atrial natriuretic hormone is a cardiac hormone which gene and receptors are widely present in the body. Its main function is to lower blood pressure and to control electrolyte homeostasis. ANP inhibits ACTH release and arginine vasopressin secretion. Vasopressin enhances ANP synthesis while GH decreases it. Adrenocorticotropic hormone controls the production of another hormone called cortisol. Cortisol is made by the adrenal glands, two small glands located above your kidney. Cortisol plays an important role in helping you to respond to stress. Arginine vasopressin naman promotes the reabsorption of water from the tubular fluid in the collecting duct, the hydrosmotic effect, and it does not exert a significant effect on the rate of sodium reabsorption. Increased blood pressure in the right atrium of the heart causes increased secretion of ANH, which increases sodium excretion and water loss in the form of urine. Fluid volume and blood pressure are closely related. Changes in fluid volume cause changes in blood volume, which affects blood pressure. The heart secretes a hormone to help control blood pressure. This hormone is called atrial natriuretic peptide, or ANP. ANP is secreted by the atria of the heart. ANP is secreted in response to an increase in blood volume. ANP targets the kidneys and causes a decrease in sodium reabsorption. More sodium exits the body. When sodium exits, more water follows by osmosis, and fluid volume decreases, causing subsequent decreases in blood volume and blood pressure. ANP affects blood vessels by causing vasodilation. This also works to lower blood pressure. ANP vasodilates the afferent arteriole, which brings blood into the glomerulus, thereby increasing the amount of filtrate produced by the kidneys. This causes more sodium and water excreted by the kidneys, which helps to lower blood pressure. Other effects of ANP include inhibiting the renin-angiotensin system, reducing aldosterone secretion by the adrenal cortex, and releasing free fatty acids from adipose tissue. Okay, so you have to read through this. It is found in your book too. So when homeostasis is disturbed, in cases that, for example, you have a high, you have a high blood pressure, the elevated blood pressure will produce these actions. So your pituitary will react, your kidneys, your heart, and your blood vessels. All of them will help each other to have these reactions and then reduce your blood volume. Okay, so that blood volume will remain in normal range. The same goes as when there is low blood volume or lowered blood pressure. Again, your blood vessels, your heart, your kidney, and your pituitary will do its work to gather and produce these uh, reactions and restore your homeostasis. Micturition or urination. It is the process of emptying urine from the storage organ, namely the urinary bladder. The detrusor is the smooth or involuntary muscle of the bladder wall. The urethral muscles consist of the external and internal sphincter. The internal sphincter and detrusor muscle are both under autonomic control. The external sphincter, however, is a voluntary muscle under the control of voluntary nerves. The bladder normally accommodates up to 300 to 400 ml in adults. When the bladder is distended, it sends signals to the brain which is perceived as the full bladder sensation. The process of emptying the urine into the urethra is regulated by nervous signals both from the somatic and the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system comprises both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system if you can remember. The bladder has two states of function, the storage and the emptying phase. Neural control of urination, micturition reflex. When the bladder is full, 
Stretch receptors in the wall of the bladder send nerve impulses to the sacral region of the spinal cord. By way of a parasympathetic response, signals return to the bladder and stimulate contraction of the muscle of the bladder and relaxation of the internal urethral sphincter. This part of the reflex is involuntary and is predominant in infants and young children. As the central nervous system matures, it acquires voluntary control over the external urethral sphincter. Urination is controlled mainly by the micturition center in the pons. This center receives sensory signals from the bladder and communicates with the cortex about the appropriateness of urinating at the moment. At times when it's not convenient to urinate, the center sends back an inhibitory signal to keep the sphincters closed and prevent voiding. When you wish to urinate, this inhibition is removed. The spinal cord instructs the muscle of the bladder to contract and the sphincters to open to let the urine out. In the body, water moves through semi-permeable membranes of cells and from one compartment of the body to another by a process called osmosis. Osmosis is basically the diffusion of water from regions of higher concentration to regions of lower concentration along an osmotic gradient across a semi-permeable membrane. As a result, water will move into and out of cells and tissues depending on the relative concentrations of water and solutes found there. An appropriate balance of solutes inside and outside of cells must be maintained to ensure normal function. Human beings are mostly water, ranging from about 75% of body mass in infants to about 50-60% to in adult men and women to as low as 45% when we get old. The percent of body water changes with development because the proportions of body given over each organ and to muscles, fat, bone, and other tissues change from infancy to adulthood. Your brain and kidneys have the highest proportions of water, which composes 80 to 85% of their masses. In contrast, your teeth have the lowest proportion of water at 8 to 10%. Compartments. The intracellular fluid compartment is the system that includes all fluid enclosed in cells by their plasma membrane. So this is the intracellular fluid here. Extracellular fluid surrounds all cells in the body. Extracellular fluid has two primary constituents, the fluid component of the body called plasma and the in interstitial fluid that surrounds all cells not in the blood. The ICF makes up about 60% of the total water in the human body and in an average size adult male, the ICF accounts for about 25 liters or 7 gallons of fluid. This fluid volume tends to be very stable because the amount of water in living cells is closely regulated. If the amount of water inside a cell falls to a value that is too low, the cytosol becomes too concentrated with solutes to carry on normal cellular activities. If too much water enters a cell naman, the cell may burst and be destroyed. The ECF or extracellular fluid accounts for the one-third of the body's water content. Approximately 20% of the ECF is found in the plasma. Plasma travels through the body in blood vessels and transport a range of materials including your blood cell proteins, including clotting factors and antibodies, electrolytes, nutrients, gases, and wastes. Gases, nutrients, and waste materials travel between capillaries and cells through the IF. Cells are separated from the IF by a selective permeable cell membrane that helps regulate the passage of materials between the IF and the interior of the cell. The body has other water-based ECF. These include the cerebrospinal fluid that bathes the brain and spinal cord, the lymph, the synovial fluid in joints, the pleural fluid in the pleural cavities, the pericardial fluid in the cardiac sac, the peritoneal fluid in the peritoneal cavity, and the aqueous humor of the eye. Because these fluids are outside of cells, these fluids are also considered components of the ECF.
What is in the spaces between cells? Well, if we look at a group of cells, we have intracellular, which means inside of a cell, and extracellular, being the space outside of a cell. These groups of cells make up a tissue as they're performing common functions. Many tissues differ in the types and amount of fluid material between cells. So, again, here we have a group of cells along with a blood vessel. This fluid that surrounds the cells and is separate from the blood vessel is called interstitial fluid. This interstitial fluid contains water, proteins, electrolytes, salts, acids, hormones, and cell waste materials. There are also other components in this extracellular space, which together are called the extracellular matrix. The extracellular matrix often contains collagen fibers, elastin fibers, glycoproteins, which are proteins with carbohydrate subunits attached, and proteoglycans, which are made up of complex carbohydrates, proteins, and smaller carbohydrates. The interstitial fluid and extracellular matrix have some important functions. In some tissues, the components of the extracellular matrix are connected to proteins embedded in the plasma membrane of cells, which are connected to components of the cytoskeleton inside of the cell, holding the tissue together and providing structural support of the tissue. These connections also allow the cells to communicate with one another. Another important function is that the interstitial fluid allows for the delivery of nutrients to the cells as it receives nutrients from blood vessels and delivers them to tissue cells, so the cells can continue to thrive and do their jobs. Thirst regulation. Osmoreceptors, specialized cells in the hypothalamus of the brain, are stimulated by the decrease in their cell water, and their activation initiates the thirst mechanism, that is drinking of water, and the release into the blood of antidiuretic hormone from the pituitary gland. The most potent hormonal stimulus of thirst, or for thirst, is angiotensin II, which is generated when the rate-limiting enzyme renin is secreted by the kidneys in response to hypovolemia or hypotension. So this is how your thirst mechanism happens. Buffers. A buffer is a solution that can resist pH change upon the addition of an acidic or basic components. It is able to neutralize small amounts of added acid or base, thus maintaining the pH of the solution relatively stable. This is important for processes and or reactions which require specific and stable pH ranges. So this is how buffers work. So ihalo mo siya dyan. Maging ganito siya. Acute renal failure. Acute renal failure occurs when your kidneys suddenly become unable to filter waste products from your blood. When your kidneys lose their filtering ability, dangerous levels of wastes may accumulate and your blood's chemical makeup may get out of balance. Acute kidney failure is most common in people who are already hospitalized, particularly in critically ill people who need intensive care. It can be fatal and requires intensive treatment. However, uh, kidney failure may be reversible. If you're otherwise in good health, you may recover normal or nearly or nearly normal kidney function. These are the signs and symptoms of acute renal failure. So we have decreased urine output, fluid retention, shortness of breath, fatigue, confusion, nausea, weakness, irregular heartbeat, chest pain or pressure, seizures or coma in severe cases. Hemodialysis is a, pre, uh, is a procedure where a dialysis machine and a special filter called an artificial kidney or a dialyzer are used to clean your blood. To get your blood into the dialyzer, the doctor needs to make an access or entrance into your blood vessels. This is done with minor surgery, usually to your arm. 